Broadcasting from the campus of Howard University, you're watching WHMM-TV, Howard University Television. it was very easy at that time to make the comparison between the rise of Nazism in Germany and, and the rise of, uh, of the national party state, the apartheid state in South Africa. And there seemed uh, to be no difference between, between the two types of racism. It was very clear to us that it was the same disease being replayed and being reintroduced in South Africa, and that it had not, in fact, been destroyed. And when the apartheid uh, state was coming into, into being, the cities at night were suddenly out of bounds for us. And I wanted to be, you know, in, under the lights of the neon. And it, it just irked me that I, I could not walk about at night and I was treated as if I was a criminal simply by being in the streets at night. When a policeman told you, get on the bus and get back to the township, what are you doing in the center of the city at night? Because there was the white by night law. Nine o'clock, you've got to be out of town. the blacks were living were pretty appalling. One could not wait for the revolution to come along and rescue one from this kind of impoverished life. So anything that came along to provide the fantasy uh, was most welcome. <laughs> just to sit in this dark place and magic takes place on the wall. For a moment we forgot apartheid. We forgot that there was another world that wasn't good. We sat there and were carried away by the dream of these American movies. <laughs> the biggest thing for a black person was to take someone to the cinema. When I sat in the cinema, the world opened. I saw words London, America, Europe. Then the world in my head got bigger. I could see other people. I could understand other worlds, other languages, other cultures. That was cinema. It brought about an incredible understanding to the black people in this country, that they, especially as a young black boy, that the world is not South Africa. We're part of a bigger world. <laughs> Young people would stand at street corners discussing the lives of film stars as if these were, were neighbors. The, oh, did you see Richard Whitmer coming? Uh, how, how he punched that guy? <laughs> you think a squealer can get away from me? It was an 
entirely out of the question that you could actually go to the same cinemas as, uh, as white people. The cinemas in, in uh, South Africa were always, of course, uh, segregated like everything else. There were black cinemas and white cinemas. Much more for your money. You wouldn't see the second feature until the owner decided he sold enough soft drinks. You, know, you get intermission 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, you know, so, and are people shouting, come on, we want to see the next movie. <laughs> right through the week, carrying old ladies' bags, trying to do everything, be nice to mom and dad, especially Friday, because the biggest outing was Saturday, going to the cinema. We used to pay seven pennies. It was incredible. It was fact, the whole bug this, of me being an actor is a result of those great movies. Zorro rides again, and Zorro rides yet again. Uh, all American, of course, a uh, spy smasher. Tex Rita, Roy Rogers. Like <sighs> Clark Gable, Betty Grable. These films were influential in uh, the way people tried to dress. Say, for instance, Richard Widmark. He wore a hat, you know, raked at a very snappy angle. And after that, everybody who wore a hat or who could afford to buy a hat uh, wore it at the same angle. It was the style that captivated their imagination. This program is coming to you from the Cotton Club in Harlem, New York City. Now, Cat Calloway, the Prince of Heidi Ho, will entertain you with some hot dog and my if the American film also had black, or it was about black life, then uh, the impact was uh, that much greater. Pretty soon you had uh, guys, I mean, in the, in the dance halls wearing the same kind of clothes, zoot suits. Young people, young boys were actually writing to America. They uh, get hold of the catalogs showing uh, special shoes like flush iron shoes. And when these boys were, um, were going to parties at night, they would uh, pull up their socks and they'd show you these shoes. And, and they used to call them can gets. You see, because you couldn't get it in, you couldn't get that shoe in Johannesburg, they said. See, this, this one comes straight from New York, man. It's a can get. And it was all the influence of the film and watching of people who were very much like you, were black like you. Hollywood had a tremendous influence on the lifestyles of, uh, of the black community. And some of the influences were inevitably uh, bad. Gangster films, for example, provided certain models for people who felt trapped uh, in this situation, situation of oppression. But Hollywood also suggested certain options, even if they were not realistic options, but options which temporarily would provide escape from the roles 
of victim and make the gangster uh, the person in charge of the situation, someone who would be in a position of power. We saw this situation where the African population were being fed these miserable films. I mean, they, they were full of violence. They were full of uh, trivial lives. I mean, they were, they, as I say, they were the cheapest kind of film you could get out of Hollywood. We started talking about why don't, you know, why don't somebody make a really good film about Africans with African actors? A, a full-length entertainment film. So some uh, white people arrived in South Africa and decided, you know, why import them from America? Make them cheaper here and uh, make a film set in South Africa, in black South Africa. They realized that uh, the black audiences wanted to see black faces on screen. Whites always feel that we, the black, our minds are black, are black, our breath is black, everything is black. Now, they never give us a chance. People who really give us chances are people from overseas who come in here and feel that, but these people, they've got talent. The difference between uh, white South Africans and white foreigners, that the white South Africans were the people who were oppressing us, and there's a belief that all white foreigners were much more liberal in their thinking and in their attitudes than our own uh, local uh, whites oppressors. We certainly thought that if, if we could create a, a, a black film industry, that they would gradually take over with their own uh, personality, with their own identity. <laughs> Looking at it now, it seems so unreal. It, it does seem like a fantasy. We found that these people, by going into the township, nobody in the... the uh, the white world really knew about this. It was a whole sort of subculture which they really weren't aware of. So we were able to go around and, and find talent and gradually put it together to make this, this film. Ah, Captain Rhythm, Captain Rhythm, ah, Captain Rhythm, Captain Rhythm, Rhythm. And there were several people who were uh, auditioning for the actual uh, chief role of, of the female in the film. And shortly after, this other woman appeared, and she was very uh, nervous. She was very unprepossessingly dressed. We just took one look at her at first. We said, oh, well, it's a nice looking girl, but I mean, what can we do with that? You know? I said, no, I can't fit in here. Still, I, I'm, I was afraid. She got in front of a camera, and it was like something out of a movie. I and mean, suddenly, this woman, took on a whole new personality. Her eyes sparkled, her face broke into a smile, she had a sort of swing to her body, and she sang like a, like a bird. I mean, she was just absolutely wonderful. And we immediately said, this, this is the woman. I just sang, and, oh, I went to Joburg, the golden city. Oh, why did I go there for? <laughs> came to Joburg, the golden city. Oh, why did I come here for? I'm a long way from home in Joburg city, so far away from my home. Oh, a man was picked up from Joburg city. He was the man that I loved. He bought me jewels and gold to say, and sold my away. Oh, I came to Joburg, the golden city. Oh, why did I come here for? I'm a long way from home in Joburg city. 
so far away from Margot. And it was just around the time we were making that film, the National got into power. It gradually became evident over the next couple of years, fairly quickly, they started to introduce more stringent laws. They had already got these ridiculous pass laws. And one night, apparently, Dolly was out late somewhere or another and got arrested. It was not so late, but do you know, there the vans and everything at night, more especially in the white suburbs. The police were so hot then, I was afraid. I thought I'd take a walk down the road one evening. I was arrested for pass. <laughs> They just took me and I slept in jail. We immediately spread this over all the newspapers, making the regime look stupid. I mean, it made those laws look ridiculous. Oh, I came to Juba, the golden city. Oh, why did I come here for? I'm a long way from home in Joburg City. So far away from my throne. There were no trained black actors, which is why most of these films were musicals. It wasn't properly thought through in many ways. Uh, we were tended to insert a musical number into it because we liked the musical number, you know. One of the things which was quite amusing was somebody heard these men in the street lifting a very, very heavy object. They were singing, and somehow or another, we all got in, intrigued with this, and we said, let's, let's reproduce that on film. They had a marvelous kind of rhythm to it. And then one day when we were sitting, uh, looking through the film in, in the proje projection room, and I was with one of the, the black uh, assistants, and I said, listen, you know, we never have found out what those men are really singing. What is it they sing? And he said, oh, you didn't know? And I said, no, I didn't know. He said they were singing, to hell with these goddamn white men who make us work so hard and pay us nothing. We decided, forget it, we would just leave it in the film. And of course, it amused the black audience enormously. The plot in matter, a film shot in, uh, with people you recognized on streets that you knew. You know, and it, uh, sometimes it's difficult to hear the dialogue because uh, people are shouting, hey, that's my street, I live down that, that street, you know, that kind of thing. You know, so it, it's off, they became like home movies. Please! It was not a, a very carefully planned film. But what came out of it was something that was of tremendous import to the Africans at that time. It suited the psychology of the audience very well because they identified you know, somebody who was in a very simple job, people doing this kind of thing, who could then suddenly become uh, recognized as an individual. <laughs> It's a question of sort of finding their voice in the sense that we had decided to make entertainment. 
You know, Johnny, he deserves a chance with a voice like that. Well, you can have one. We wanted to to make something that was their own, but of course that inevitably was political. In fact, the population uh, got an enormous charge out of it. They really felt that this was their film, it was an expression of themselves, uh, of their own personality. They had never seen an actual African starring in a movie. This was quite unknown. <laughs> I thought I'd seen you somewhere before. You're the boy sack. I'm sorry, sir. There's nothing to do. Oh, forget it. You're no good as a servant. But, my boy, you certainly can sing. In fact, I want you to sing for me on my record. Thank you very much. All right, Jim, I'll see you after the show. As we know, a film has a, a tremendous emotional effect on people. At that time, it meant that those black people who starred in African Jim, they became the equal of the Hollywood film stars instantly, just by being in that film. We've never, ever, ever seen a black person on the screen. That was the whites only affair. And when Jim came, comes to Jobeck was shown, it was like a, a miracle. We saw black people in this movie. We saw black people talking. And then it was shown to the black audiences in the townships, where it practically created a riot. It was so successful. That continued, but what happened in the interim was that we really hadn't realized that we were treading heavily on the feet of the commercial organizations. They wanted to prevent us distributing our film. Everything in the film, in the theater, was controlled by white money, white people, white cameras, white sound men. These people were very hard-nosed businessmen. Uh, they weren't interested in any idea of a native film industry. That was not in their minds at all. They were in it to make money in the, in the maximum amount of money possible. They decided to make another musical film, an all-black film for Africans called Zonk. Here's a surprise. Most of you good people have heard Europeans impersonate darkies. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we give you a darkie impersonating a very famous European who impersonates the darkie. Mammy! I'm riding the wings of an autumn breeze. September in the rain. The sun went out just like a dying amber. Bad During the 50s, they had these lunatic attempts to separate the races. For example, people had to be separated out in terms of their ethnic groups, whether they were colored or whether they were indigenous Africans or whites. And they would use um, uh, combs or pencils to run through your hair if you claimed as a black person that you were, you were of mixed blood origin. 
um, or, or stab you quickly with a, sh a sharp point of something, of an object. Uh, and it depended very much on how you, you yelled out in pain. That resulted in, in very tragic consequences of families being separated from one another um, because of the one child was darker than another. Everything was for whites in South Africa. You have to understand the apartheid. It divides even the way of thinking. Even in the township where I lived, everything, it had to be white. He had a song called Kupete Lumlungu, Kumdomnyama Soza Kwenzelendo, because the song said it's better to be white because things go right when you're white. Do you understand? That was the concept. Even with the incoming of the great uh, skin lightning creams, it was trying to be lighter because that was the in thing. Lighter and lovelier. The lighter, lovelier skin, the modern way. Just like a dying amber, that's September. What strikes you about those films in the 50s, we didn't see very much of our lives in specific terms, or in South African terms. One of the people who appeared in Johannesburg was Sultan Corder, because he was coming out to make Cry the Beloved Country from the Alan Payton book. There is a lovely road that runs from Ikopo into the hills. These hills are grass-covered and rolling and they are lovely beyond any singing of it. Cry the Beloved Country um, was as important for South Africa as Uncle Tom's Cabin uh, might have been for the United States. Uh, it, for the first time, uh, the international community was really alerted to the plight of black South Africans. And yet, at the same time, um, the black community itself, especially the intellectuals in the black community, had reservations about Cry That Beloved Country because of uh, what they thought was its uh, paternalistic tone. The novel itself had been around uh, a few years. I'd read it. It did a lot of good things in uh, changing some people's perspectives. But then the film, it had professional actors, uh, big names like Kenda Lee, uh, Sidney Poitier. It was for us the first professionally done, serious, if you like, uh, film about uh, what it was like to be black in South Africa. I have another great sorrow. You must tell me. A son, maybe, or a daughter. Son, Absalom is his name. We sent him to look for my sister, but he too never came back. Now I'm still more afraid. We will try to find him, my friend. It was about us shot in our locales. <laughs> so you had Canada, and then you had Sydney Portier. Along? And the story became real to them too. For instance, they were not staying in hotels. They, were, they had to get a house outside town so that they could stay there because they couldn't stay in a hotel because they were black. I'm told you can help me to find a young man. Absalom Kumal. I'm not here for trouble. Look for yourself. He's looking for a son that is lost and everywhere we go, they tell us to go somewhere else. Yes, I know this young man. And where is he now? He went to Shantytown, but that was a year ago. How I got into Cry the Beloved Country, which is an international film, was quite by fluke. I was picked for a film test, and lo and behold, I got into the film. In Cry the Beloved Country, I 
played the part of uh, Absalom, who is the uh, son of the old priest in the, in the country, who leaves home to go to the city. Are you sure it's all right? Tell you the woman and the children are away and the white man is at work. There's only the servant there. When he gets there, he gets with the gangs. Have you got the revolver? We had boys exactly like that who came from the country, couldn't get jobs. And the next thing, they got themselves into trouble. And this is really what, what uh, uh, Absalom was. I find you, Absalom Kumalo, guilty of the murder of Arthur Trevelyan Jarvis at his residence in Park World on the afternoon of the 8th day of October. Have you anything to say before I pronounce sentence? I killed this man. I did not mean to kill him. Only I was afraid. Silence! I sentence you, Absalom Kamalo, to be returned to custody and to be hanged by the neck until you are dead. Oh. And may the Lord have mercy upon your soul. Oh. Silence in the court! When you look at Cry Thou Beloved Country, it portrays the system of justice in South Africa uh, as dispassionate, very calm, um, obviously politically uninvolved. But from the point of view of the black community, the main defect in the film was in ascribing criminality to the character of Absalom, the murderer, without assigning uh, proper responsibility to the system itself. I know it was a white story. I know it was written by a white person. But again, you must understand to see our people in the screen, to see people we, who will become our heroes in it and be able to say, I'm not Tex Ritter, I'm not Roy Rogers, but I'm Sidney Potty. I mean, South Africa was very proud of that film. You know, it, uh, they didn't look at it as a subversive film from the whites. You know, it was talking about the conditions of the blacks, but I mean, everybody knows the conditions of the blacks, and so it was, it wasn't, they didn't feel it controversial. At the Coliseum Theatre, Johannesburg, and simultaneously in Durban and Cape Town, the great film, Cry the Beloved Country, has its world premiere, the most brilliant film premiere seen in South Africa. Certainly no film has ever been more eagerly awaited. The entire proceeds of the Johannesburg opening went to the South African Institute of Race Relations. The preview was attended by the Prime Minister of South Africa, Dr. D.F. Malan. The great paradox, of course, present in the audience to give his blessing was the principal architect of apartheid, Prime Minister Dr. Malan. This truly was a momentous occasion, but particularly so for Mr. Alan Payton, the author of the book and co-producer of the film, for whom the Prime Minister had congratulations. A brilliant launching of a classic film. And the next paradox is the absence of blacks in the audience, including the actors, the black actors. Now, nobody seemed to ask why it was that there were no black people there. Um, well, you know, not even film critics. I don't think that the film critics even mentioned anything about it, and I don't think that anybody approached the film critics. Uh, I don't think so, no, because um, very soon after it was shown at the Coliseum, it was then shown in a, uh, one of our non-European cinemas. So I think that the, uh, the black people were quite happy to see it then. Another dimension, of course, to, to all this, the fact that for the black African in South Africa, uh, it was not possible to simply go to any film uh, that arrived in the country. The films were actually graded 
in accordance with a certain hierarchy. At the top, you had the whites. And then in the middle, you had the coloreds, And then at the bottom, blacks. And I remember that a white child was given the same grading or permission to view as a, uh, as a, a grown-up uh, adult uh, black African. This censorship was a source of bitter anger. For example, we were so mad about certain products from Hollywood being censored as unseeable by us because we, we were not adult enough as blacks to see such, uh, such products. And uh, I, I remember at times we petitioned the industry in Hollywood to intervene in our behalf uh, against such censorship. And I don't remember uh, them doing anything about it. Good morning, come in and see the museum. In this room you have the lights from the Colosseum. And this here, the African Consolidated Forms, this is an original hand-painted glass mat that was used in the 20th Century Fox African Consolidated Form trademark. This room is probably the culmination of Everything that is cinema in South Africa and America. From the early 1900s, there was a little Hollywood in South Africa. thing was that the South African film industry made cowboys and Indians westerns between the white conqueror in South Africa and the Zulus. And later on, Hollywood itself went out to South Africa and, uh, and made the same kind of film. But when you think about it, you realize the mythologies of white conquests of native races are virtually the same and interchangeable. Taka, you lead the spare horses, the ammunition. Christian, we'll charge through the Zulus around the lager. Ready? Move! here in Africa fighting Zulus. It's me. It's still good to see you, Katya. It was good to see you, Paul, for everybody. The tea set and ashtrays were part of the 20th Century Fox flair, and tea used to be brought in in the 20th Century Fox cups and saucers and was served, and it just made something nice. It, it wasn't just an everyday tea set. Mr. Edward F. Lomba, managing director of 20th Century Fox in South Africa, signs a contract with the director of state information, Mr. Pete Maring, to give worldwide release to information films made in South Africa. 
Movie and television outlets are included. And State Information Office films, which reached an estimated audience of 100 million last year, will take a tremendous step towards being viewed by a potential 400 million in numerous countries. And so the true story of South Africa will be brought to vast audiences throughout the world. On the Indian Ocean, we arrive at Durban, South Africa's favorite resort for a holiday. The beach here is a favorite health resort. For the elders, there's the game of bowls, the old British sport of bowling on the green. This is the most popular recreation in South Africa. What we found reprehensible about uh, Hollywood and its intervention in South Africa was that they could uh, accept business of uh, creating propaganda films for the South African government, at the same time exploit uh, the potential audience uh, amongst the black communities of South Africa without taking any responsibility at all. When thinking of a holiday, we recall the world's great vacation resorts but seldom count in South Africa. But here on the Indian Ocean is one of the fairest and finest. I heard about South Africa and the, the rise of apartheid in the National Party. It sounded very ominous to me. And I was very concerned about reawakening of fascism, as I thought, you know, because we had defeated fascism in World War II, but I didn't feel it was defeated. It was a, only a temporary victory. I felt it would reemerge and continue in different forms. The situation in South Africa was connected to everything else, imperialism, racism, etc. I came there to do a film against apartheid, to expose apartheid. Particularly in Johannesburg. I thought, I'd seen this place. You know, it's, it was all familiar to me. Well, of course, the blacks were very familiar. The way they sounded, their sound and their laughter. There was an enormous influence of American culture, particularly on the blacks. It was like a mecca to them, which sort of, I found ironic that America was so racist, and yet for the Africans, it was like some paradise. <laughs> The music, the films, it was like being back in America. He was American, and an American who is in the film business, for us who've been brought up on American films, you know, he was away and running before, <laughs> as soon as he got off the plane and introduced himself. And Lionel, he simply went to Drum magazine where most of the people from outside, especially if they were writers or artists, uh, went to make contact with my generation of, uh, of 50s writers, because most of them were centered around a drum magazine. The first person I met was Bloke Modisani. And we hit it off beautifully. I mean, we, it was a perfect uh, rapport. When I think of Bloke, to me, he was a walking paradox. One couldn't believe what uh, kind of music one listened to when one went into Block Modisani's uh, uh, little hovel in Sofata. Here was a man having only one room. In the corner of this room, his little record player. And suddenly you, you are walking into this uh, yard and you hear Mozart and Beethoven being played. And of course this man was obsessed with, with all these different cultural experiences. It seemed so unlike, so improbable, so implausible. And uh, Lewis, very young, brash, the literary intellectual, you know, uh, who uh, quotes from books 
Uh, he used to walk around Sofia, the only person who dared walk around Sofia Town carrying a pile of books. And Ten Temba represented uh, something else again, like a, a walking teacher, a village teacher. Um, ev everywhere he went, uh, people wanted to listen to what he had to say. If we had tried hard enough for all sorts of people to get together, to belong together, to feel that they belong, and what's wrong with all different kinds of people getting together? It was Lewis and Bloke and I who were sort of going around everywhere. The problem was it was a bit of danger because there I was exposing myself because I was not legally allowed to go into Sophia Town. As a white, I was not allowed to go into Sophia Town. We took him, of course, into the townships, unlike most white South Africans. Most of them don't even know where the townships are. They've never been within miles of them. He was taking all of those risks, uh, which uh, a less than conscientious filmmaker would have simply bypassed. He would have wanted to, to get on with, it, with making something and then getting the hell out of South Africa. I didn't write anything for six months. We spent a lot of time just drinking together, talking an awful amount. He was asking questions all the time. He didn't have uh, preconceptions. And then I told the Bloke and Lewis that I wanted them to help me write the script, and I wanted them to give me the story. And so the three of us sat down on a Saturday afternoon and uh, talked it out. And I made notes, and, and it was about six hours, and that was it. That was our story. From the beginning, I had an idea what I wanted to show, what life is like for an African, what pressure he's under, what humiliations, what pain, what suffering Africans have under apartheid. I had been on a queue at the bus station looking for my actors and was casting, because they probably thought I was nuts. You go on a bu bus queue to cast your actors. <laughs> they, they went along with it. And of course, that's how I found Zachariah, my main character. And then the, the people who became involved as actors in it, who had no training whatsoever. Yes, Morning. boy, what do you want? The bus say I must send that, give that letter for you. My husband fix your cross. Yes, ma'am. What's your name? Zachariah. Zachariah? Yes. No, that won't do. I'll call you Jack. All right. Hang on, there's the phone. All right, come in. Jack, how could you have been so stupid if you didn't understand? Why didn't you say so? But then, madam, it's not my fault. You tell me that I must wash the floor. Don't answer back at me. I'm not going to take that cheek from you. Do you understand? And hurry up with the vegetables. You make me late enough as it is. You know, Myrtle, I don't think you treat him this chap Jack quite rightly. Oh, you too soft. They're only simple country natives who come here and are completely inexperienced, don't know the first thing about electricity or brooms, and you treat them as if they must cook mushroom soup. These people are uncivilized. If you could have seen the way that boy looked at me in the kitchen, for two pins he would have slit my throat. I tell you something, they're just savages, savages. People were playing uh, white people were mostly progressive uh, white South African, but they were so uh, aware and so familiar uh, with the brutalizing aspects of um, of black and white life in South Africa that they were able to project this so authentically. You speak to me, you call me fast, understand, eh? Yes. Niggas are getting too cheeky. Okay. Can you work, John? Yes. Sir. Are you sure you can work? Yes, sir. I don't want any lazy cappers on the job, yeah? No, I'll work. Let me see your pass. But his permission to seek work has expired already. But can't you do something for himself, please? Do you know you can be arrested walking around with your passport like this? Yes. Do you know that? What's that? I'm coming.
coming now. Okay, what's it? What's it? Come on, 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 While we were making Comeback Africa, there was, of course, the treason trial of about 156 political leaders going on in Johannesburg at the time, an attempt to curtail freedom to speak. I suspect that the few places where you could actually speak your mind uh, was in these uh, speakeasies, what we call shabins where you could meet people across the all social classes. And there was a place of vitality where there were a lot of exchanges of ideas. If I could get my worst enemy over a bottle of beer, maybe we could get at each other. It's not just a question of just talking to each other, but it's a question of understanding each other, living in the same world. With Comeback Africa, a whole lot of languages have become available for the filmmaker. Black intellectuals articulating their own experience. I had Bloke, Lewis, Cantemba. These were all heavyweights, you know, intellectuals, theorists, journalists. Uh, and I had heard them talking many, many times. So I more or less knew what they said and what they thought. And it pretty much coincided with my ideas and with with the concept of the film. We shot that scene, you know, just in one city with two cameras. He likes liberals. Boy, I'm telling you, the liberal just doesn't want a grown-up African. Mm -hmm. He wants the African he can sort of patronize, mm -hmm. pet on his head, you see, mm -hmm. and tell him that with just a little bit of luck, you see, someday you'll be a grown-up man, fully civilized. That's a lie. He about... wants the African from the country, from his natural environment, unspoiled. That's not a liberal. Yo, you are talking contaminated. When the world comes to liberals, savage they promise you the vote. But this, yes, liberals yeah. are more... Why they are having the country? Yeah. But this liberals are They more can more. keep the vote more. We want the country, then we'll give them the vote. <laughs> <laughs> that was not acting in that uh, that was ha what happened in Shibin's every, every every night you know uh, long philosophical arguments about everything and nothing <laughs> and what the comeback of represents is a shift from white people trying to express a vision for blacks and allowing uh, blacks to express themselves, to be in control of their own discourse, if you wish. We live in a world of violence. And violence has become such an important part that people judge us according to our racial characteristics, which shouldn't apply. It doesn't matter if you're an Indian or a Jew or a German or an Africana. Oh, but if people can label you, they label you easily. Now you're really going overboard, aren't you? I know I am, but I'm trying to explain the bigger things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The reason why we are being labeled like this is just because it's easy to label us racialistically. Now that won't work. How's that? Because it's easy to distinguish one color from another. Because people think they can get away by playing one color against another. In that scene in Comeback Africa, we're all uh, sitting around and they should be discussing. There is still a tremendous feeling of hope. The idea that you could actually change South Africa through passive resistance and the moral force of your argument. A few months after that, I find myself in Sharpville witnessing the massacre of African people, single major event of the end of the 50s. The newsreel 
images of the massacre at Shabro defined us, Black South Africans, for the entire world as victims of a system. <laughs>